GPGPU stands for General Purpose Computing on Graphics Processing Units. GPGPU is being used for artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency mining, self-driving vehicles, scientific computing, and many more cutting-edge applications. It's all the rage, but what is it exactly? Isn't the GPU just for computer graphics? How is it possible that something so specialized can be used for general purpose computing? And even if you can, why would you? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I'm your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. By the end of today's tutorial, you'll know the answers to the following questions. What's a GPU? What's the difference between a GPU and a CPU? What is GPGPU? What's CUDA? And what's CUDA.jl? This tutorial will focus on high-level concepts, so you can watch most of this video on a mobile device without having watched any of my previous tutorials. At the very end of this tutorial, I'm going to go through a demonstration that shows the power of using GPGPU versus the traditional approach of using a CPU. If you would like to try the demonstration for yourself, you will need access to a desktop or laptop computer that has a GPU manufactured by NVIDIA. I'm also assuming that you have Julia installed on your computer and that you have VS Code installed along with a Julia extension for VS Code. I covered the installation and setup of both Julia and VS Code in episode one of this tutorial series. With that said, let's start by answering the question, what's a GPU? GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit. The term GPU is often used interchangeably with a graphics card, but they are in fact two separate things. So before we can answer the question, what's a GPU? Let's answer the question, what's a graphics card? According to its Wikipedia article, a graphics card is an expansion card, which generates a feed of output images to a display device, such as a computer monitor. So the graphics card is the entire unit made from a printed circuit board that contains several different components, including output ports for displays and one or two rather large fans. All of these components work together to make it possible for you to play graphics intensive video games and to work on important creative computer graphics projects, like making memes. The main component of the graphics card is the GPU which is the brain of the graphics card. So now we can answer the question, what's a GPU? According to its Wikipedia article, a graphics processing unit is a specialized electronic circuit designed to manipulate and alter memory to accelerate the creation of images in a frame buffer intended for output to a display device. GPUs have been around since the 1970s when they were used mainly in commercial arcade video games. In the 1980s, GPUs became more affordable, so they began to appear in home video game consoles and in personal desktop computers. Today, GPUs are ubiquitous and may be found in embedded systems, mobile phones, personal computers, workstations, and game consoles. Now, you may be wondering, doesn't my computer already have a brain? Isn't that what the CPU is for? Why does my computer need two brains? To understand that, let's answer the question, what's the difference between a GPU and a CPU? CPU stands for Central Processing Unit, and it's the primary brain of your computer that does most of the work. In the past, CPUs traditionally only had one core, which is the processor and central processing unit. 
But today, CPUs often have multiple cores, which is like having multiple brains. For example, the Intel Core i9-12900HX CPU has 16 cores. Each core is very fast. In this particular example, each core has a maximum speed ranging from 3.6 GHz to 5 GHz. The speed is also known as the clock rate. A CPU with a single core must perform all tasks in sequence. But a CPU with multiple cores can perform some tasks in parallel by offloading the extra tasks onto different cores. While this may be interesting, what does any of this have to do with a GPU? Well, let's take a look at the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090 Ti graphics card. The GPU that comes included with this graphics card contains 10,752 cores, which is 674 times the number of cores on Intel's i9 CPU. While the specific number of cores may vary, it's common for GPUs to have significantly more cores than CPUs. So now you may be wondering, if GPUs have so many more cores than CPUs, then why do we need CPUs at all? Well, if you dig deeper, you'll learn that each core on this GPU only has a maximum speed of 1.86 GHz, which is significantly slower than the cores on Intel's CPU. So that begs the question, which is better? Is it better to have fewer cores that are all very fast? Or is it better to have many cores that are all relatively slow? Well, it turns out that you need both. Here's a way to think about it. Imagine that you run a grocery store and you're trying to figure out the fastest way for your customers to check out. The faster they check out, the happier they'll be. So the more likely they'll turn into regular customers. The longer that they have to wait, the more likely they'll be upset. So the more likely they'll stop coming to your store. Option A is to have one experienced cashier that handles one customer per minute. Option B is to have four self-checkout stations. But since customers are not as experienced as cashiers, it takes each customer two minutes to check out by themselves. If you only have one customer in the store, then option A is better, since it only takes one minute for the customer to check out using option A. Option B will take the customer two minutes to check out by themselves. So you may be tempted to conclude that option A is better. But what if you have a surge in customers? For example, let's say you have four customers in the store and they all want to check out at the same time. In this case, option B is better, since all four customers can check out at the same time so the total time is two minutes for all four customers. If these four customers all had to wait in line for option A, then the experience would be different for all four customers. Customer one would be happy, since it only takes one minute to check out. Customer two would be indifferent, since it takes two minutes, which is the same as option B. Customer three would be irritated, since it takes three minutes to check out, since they have to wait for customers one and two to check out first. And customer four would be angry, since it takes four minutes to check out, which is two minutes longer than option B. In this analogy, option A is the CPU, and option B is the GPU. In option A, tasks are performed in series, or one after the other. In option B, tasks are performed in parallel or simultaneously. In general, option A is fine, as long as there are only one or two customers. But when there's a surge in the number of customers, 
then it's helpful to have option B available. The catch here is that each task that you offload onto option B must be independent of each other. So in our analogy, each customer's purchase is independent of each other, so it's fine to process transactions in parallel. But in some cases, tasks must be performed in sequence, since the following task may depend on the result of the previous task. Going back to our computer, a good use case for this analogy is for computer graphics. When you think about it, an image is just a matrix of floating point numbers. When you see an object moving across the screen, it's not actually an object, and it's not actually moving. It's an optical illusion caused by changing the values of those floating point numbers. In order to change those values, it only takes some simple arithmetic. But these simple calculations must be performed for every element in the matrix and must be performed 60 times per second or more. This massively high volume of arithmetic sounds like our analogy when we had a surge in customers that all wanted to check out at the same time. In this situation, the CPU offloads those calculations onto the GPU. The GPU is very good at handling high volumes of simple calculations that can be performed in parallel. When you think about it, this sounds a lot like linear algebra. This observation led some very clever people to investigate the possibility of using GPUs for tasks beyond computer graphics. Their research led to the development of a relatively new field known as GPGPU. The term GPGPU sounds like a computer component, but it actually stands for General Purpose Computing on Graphics Processing Units. In the year 2003, two research groups independently discovered that it was faster to use a GPU to solve general linear algebra problems compared to using a CPU. Here's one of the papers. It's titled Linear Algebra Operators for GPU Implementation of Numerical Algorithms by Jens Kruger and Rudiger Westermann. And here's the other paper titled Sparse Matrix Solvers on the GPU. Conjugate Gradients and Multigrid by Jeff Boltz, Ian Farmer, Etan Grinspun, and Peter Schroeder. I apologize if I mispronounced any of the names. Since there was no general purpose programming language for GPUs at the time, the research teams had to painstakingly reformulate their problems in terms of graphics primitives. Their research demonstrated the enormous potential of using GPUs for general-purpose computing, which paved the way for the development of GPGPU. But before that could happen, there was a need to create a programming language that would make it easier to perform general-purpose computing on a GPU. So if you had to create this language, what would you need? Well, First, you would need a programming language that can talk to your GPU. And second, you would need a programming language that would allow your GPU to communicate with your CPU. That is exactly what CUDA is. Originally, CUDA was an acronym for Compute Unified Device Architecture, but is simply known as CUDA today. It was initially released in 2007. The latest version is version 11.7.0, which was released in May 2022. CUDA was created by NVIDIA, so CUDA only works with CUDA-compatible GPUs made by NVIDIA. NVIDIA is one of three companies that dominate the global GPU market, along with AMD and Intel. NVIDIA was originally founded as a designer and manufacturer of graphics cards for video games, but they've invested their enormous R&D budget 
to capitalize on the potential of GPGPU in such fields as artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency mining, and self-driving vehicles. A lot of this futuristic work is made possible thanks to the creation of CUDA. CUDA is the programming language that allows users to talk to CUDA-compatible NVIDIA GPUs and allows for the CPU and the GPU to communicate with each other. At its core, CUDA is just the C programming language with some extensions and some libraries that have been optimized for their GPUs. In general, a CUDA program runs just like any other program on the CPU. But when it runs into a massive surge of processes that can be run in parallel, it will offload that portion to the GPU. This sounds great, right? So why doesn't everyone use CUDA? Well, it turns out that CUDA is not exactly a user-friendly language, and it's actually pretty difficult to use. As a result, some very clever developers have written high-level abstractions of CUDA that are now available in several different programming languages. The Julia version is called CUDA.jl. According to its GitHub page, the CUDA.jl package is the main programming interface for working with NVIDIA CUDA GPUs using Julia. It features a user-friendly array abstraction a compiler for writing CUDA kernels in Julia, and wrappers for various CUDA libraries. The lead developer is Tim Bessad, with significant contributions made by Valentin Chiravi, Mike Innes, Catherine Hyatt, and Simone Danesh. I apologize for my pronunciations. You may recognize some of these names, since they are among the most prolific developers in the Julia community. Mike Innes is the creator of the Flux package, and Simon Danish is the creator of the Maki package. When it comes to the CUDA package, there are at least three different ways that you can use it. One, you can use it just like any other Julia package, along with your Julia code for high-level, general-purpose programming. CUDA.jl will handle all of the low-level stuff under the hood, so you don't need to worry about it. Or two, if you want full control of the GPU and have a desire to get the real CUDA experience, you can use CUDA.jl to write your own low-level CUDA kernels. A CUDA kernel is just a function that runs on the GPU. Or three, you can use the built-in libraries that have been optimized for your CUDA-compatible GPU, since CUDA.jl provides Julia wrappers for those libraries. That sounds great, right? Unfortunately, using CUDA.jl does require a CUDA-compatible GPU, which is an expensive piece of hardware and not everyone will have access to it. There are some alternatives to CUDA.jl being developed for GPUs made by other manufacturers. But these alternative packages are not as mature as CUDA.jl. The JuliaGPU.org website provides some resources for those of you who have a GPU made by either AMD or Intel. There are some other resources as well. I have not tried any of these alternatives, so I cannot vouch for them but I did want to share this resource with you in case you're interested in checking it out. Okay, now that we have some high-level background knowledge, let's see a demonstration. The hello world of GPGPU seems to be something called SaxP. This 2012 blog post from NVIDIA provides some context. SAXB stands for Single Precision 8xx plus Y, where X, Y, and Z are vectors of 32-bit floating-point numbers, and A is a scalar. You may recognize this as the formula for a straight line. This formula is also widely used in machine learning, so it's a good starting example. 
The code that I'm about to share with you is from a really great YouTube video available on the HPC NRW channel. Their video provides a high-level introduction to CUDA.jl. I provided a link to their video in the description below. The only thing that I added to their code is some benchmarking code, which I took from the CUDA.jl documentation. Okay, let's open up VS Code and start coding. Open up a new terminal window if it's not open already. The first thing you want to do is to check to see if you have a CUDA compatible GPU by typing in these commands. So in my case, my GPU is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. As long as you have a recent GPU made by NVIDIA, you should be good to go. But if you want to double check, NVIDIA does provide an exhaustive list of CUDA compatible GPUs on their website. I provided a link to this website in the description below. Next, open up a new Julia session by hitting Alt-J, then Alt-O. Maximize the REPL panel. Enter the package manager by hitting the closing square bracket. Activate your tutorial directory. Add the benchmark tools package and the CUDA package. Type in status to check the version numbers. Exit the package manager by hitting backspace. Restore the REPL panel. In the Explorer panel, create a new file named saxby.jl. This is optional, but I'm going to dock my REPL panel next to my code. Okay, let's install CUDA. The CUDA.jl package will install the NVIDIA CUDA the first time you try to run the CUDA.versioninfo function. This may take a few minutes to install. Since I already have CUDA installed, it didn't take very long to print the version information. Once CUDA has been installed, we can move on to loading the benchmark tools package and defining some constant values. The values for these constants are arbitrary, so feel free to select any values. Just be sure you pick a very large number for the dimension variable. Okay, let's write standard Julia code to run Saxby on the CPU. For the vectors x, y, and z, we're just going to fill them with ones and zeros of type float32. As always, we can check the data type by using the typeof function. No surprises here, X is a standard Julia vector with elements of type float32. Next, let's perform the Saxby calculation and time how long it takes the CPU to perform these calculations. So on my computer, it took my CPU 54.232 milliseconds. Let's record this value for later. You can copy this number from the REPL by using Control c Okay, let's discuss what just happened. So all we did was take the value of pi and multiplied it by one, and then added one to it, so the result for each element turned out to be 4.1416. This is nothing more than simple arithmetic for each element in the vector. The challenging part here is that this simple arithmetic was repeated 100 million times. 
Each calculation was performed by the CPU in series, even though each calculation was independent of each other. This is a good example of a task that really should be run on a GPU. Let's see how we can do that. Let's start by reinitializing our vectors. The only difference this time is that we are using CUDA before our values. Notice that this is not a standard Julia data structure. Instead, it's something called a CUDA array or CU array. This CU array works just like a standard Julia array, except that it was created on the GPU and not on the CPU. Now let's see how fast our GPU is at calculating Saxby. Notice that we used the CUDA sync macro before our calculations. Using the CUDA sync macro tells the CPU to wait until the GPU has completed its task. This will ensure that we get an accurate measurement of the time it takes for the GPU to perform these calculations. If you scroll up in the REPL, you'll see the time. So it took my GPU 2.931 milliseconds. Let's record this value and calculate the performance compared to the CPU. So my GPU was 18 times faster than my CPU. Pretty cool, right? Just for the record, my CPU is the Intel Core i9-10900K, which has 10 cores with a base speed of 3.7 gigahertz per core. And my GPU is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Ti which has 4,352 cores with a base speed of 1.35 gigahertz per core. Your result will be different depending on your CPU and your GPU. But regardless of your hardware specs, running Saxby on a GPU is significantly faster than running Saxby on a CPU for all of the reasons that we discussed earlier in this tutorial. With this simple demonstration, you can see why GPGPU has attracted so much attention. I was able to get an enormous performance boost without having to purchase a new computer. Knowing this, I realize now that my GPU is completely underutilized since it's sitting idle most of the time. I really should be using the GPU for more things. So naturally, this begs the question, what else can we do with CUDA.jl? Find out in the next exciting episode. There wasn't a lot of code today, but there were a lot of concepts. So let's review what we learned. Today, we answered the following questions. What's a GPU? What's the difference between a GPU and a CPU? What's GPGPU? What's CUDA? And what's CUDA.jl? So on the surface, a GPU is simply the brain behind the graphics card in your computer. But at a high level, the GPU is really a platform for massive parallel computing. But the GPU is not a replacement for the CPU. You need both the CPU and the GPU for optimal performance. The CPU is necessary for normal operating conditions, but the CPU relies on the GPU 
to handle massive surges of tasks that can be run in parallel. This process was originally intended to be used only for computer graphics, but the realization that this process may be used for general purpose computing has led to the development and growth of GPGPU. This growth has been made possible thanks to programming languages that can assist users in writing programs to take advantage of this capability. CUDA is the programming language developed by NVIDIA for their GPUs, and CUDA.jl is the high-level Julia abstraction for CUDA. Using CUDA.jl will allow you to take advantage of the amazing parallel computer that's been hiding from you in plain sight. We've really just begun to scratch the surface of CUDA.jl, so we'll pick it up in the next tutorial. See you then! Well, that does it for today. If you made it this far, congratulations! <coughs> if you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, you can support me for free by smashing that like button, leaving a comment, sharing this video, and by subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support me financially, you can make a one-time contribution by using the Super Thanks button. You need to be logged in to see the Thanks button. For ongoing support, please consider joining and becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to all of my new videos. New tutorials are posted on Sundays slash Mondays. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your Julia journey.